that you allow us to be here, Lord. I pray that you serve and give us out, Lord. And uh, open the ears and the eyes of our understanding today. We're going to break down some walls. We're going to break down some barriers. Uh, we're going to uh, make some things that uh, wrong thinking right by the power of the Spirit of Jesus. Name. Amen. Amen. Right. We are in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you remember, we were supposed to be here last week. And the Lord didn't want that. The Lord held me back. And it is, it's amazing because, uh, you know, we talked about the cloud, where the Israelites had the cloud, and wherever the cloud went, they called them cloud. And, you know, the Holy Spirit is representative of that, or is that the cloud is representative of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit leads us. It leads us. Amen? Amen. And last week, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, I, I wasn't, the, the Holy Spirit wasn't leading me to teach this because I <coughs> I mean, I was studying, and I'm like, I like, just, it just wasn't happening. There was a block. There was a mental block. There was a spiritual block. So, but I know now, you know, I got here, I'm like, Lord, this is something I need to teach. And as I was, in, as I was in prayer here, He said, No, you need to go back. You need to go back. So I followed the cloud, I followed the leading of the Spirit. All right, He's not going to ever lead you astray. So, what we're going to talk about today. <clears throat> um, are some hindrances that have been in the body of Christ for probably, you know, five or six, for years, for years and years and years. And um, what we're going to talk about today, the walls that are going to be broken down today, especially in, in the thinking that we have because of our traditions and our customs and our, and our misunderstanding of the, God, the Word of God, our misinterpretation of the Word of God. Um, God isn't confined by anything, especially us. So he's going, he's going to open our minds today to hear what he has to say about something. To hear what he has to say about something. Because uh, a lot of times, women get held back in the body of Christ because of misinterpretation of the Word of God. Because of me. You think God is concerned about a person's age or a person's gender? No. I can prove he's not. I can prove he's not. But again, because of because of the Word of God says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. If you don't have knowledge on something, you don't know how to use a gun, and you're fiddling with the gun because you have a lack of knowledge of it, there's a possibility you can shoot yourself. True? Mm -hmm. But if you have knowledge of something, then you can use it in the correct way. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, uh, study to show yourself approved, a workman not ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The other thing I want to point out to you is God is God is a God of order. He is not a God of disorder. He is not a God of chaos. Okay? And the other thing that God does is He, he, is, he has shown us His heart. He has shown us, especially with Jesus. If you want to know what God's will is, the heart of God, the way He thinks, all you have to do is look at Jesus. Because He is the exact representation of God Himself. Where He is God. But when we look through the Old Testament, we can see throughout the whole Bible, anyway, we can see throughout the whole Bible where God has laid down the foundation and laid these steps, okay? It's like a train. He, we, we train off these things. And what's the best way to interpret the Word of God? With the Word of God. That's the best way to do it. There's no other way to do that. God will give you understanding about certain things, but again, you have to look to the Bible to understand the Bible. You have to read something in its context to understand the correct meaning of it. A lot of times people misinterpret things because they want to pick and choose what they think is good for them at that time. But you can't do that. You have to rightly divide the word. Amen? Amen. So with 1 Corinthians, I'm actually going to start in verse 2. It says, Now I praise you. Now this is Paul writing in a letter. Paul is writing the Corinthian church a letter. So at this point, he's going to give them some praise. He says, now I praise you because you always remember me and keep the traditions just as I deliver them to you. Underline the word tradition. The, tra uh, the definition of a tradition is a way of thinking, behaving, or doing something that has been used by people in a particular group, family, society, for a long time. One of the things that Jesus jumped on the Pharisees about is they kept the tradition of man, but they did not keep the law of God. Amen? 
they were more they were more interested and more in fear of the tradition of man. I told you the story. Um, back in the 40s, there was this actor, and this actor uh, was kind of a rebellious guy. You know, had the cigarette in his mouth all the time, had the, the certain hairdo that he, he wore, kind of a kind of a loner type. You know, always had women around him. You know, had a really bad reputation for being kind of a playboy and all that stuff. Well, he made a movie, and in the movie, he wore a yellow suit. And that character that he portrayed in the movie was that just like that. He was a guy, he abused women, he did all this, drank a lot, and did all this stuff. Well, one day in the church, after this movie came out, the men in church, the young men in church, sorry, started wearing their hair that way that this actor did and wearing yellow suits to church. So the pastor of this church, this mainstream denomination, said, you know what, this isn't something that we want to do in the church. At this point, I will not let any man come into my church wearing a yellow suit and having his hair in the style of that man. If you don't like that, you can leave the church. Don't come back. You're not welcome here. Well, that got out through the other, the other you know, uh, churches in his denomination, and they went to the council, and before you know it, People could not wear yellow, little, yellow, uh, yellow suits and have their hair that way in that denomination. So from that point, a tradition was started. Does that sound godly to you? In that story, I, not one time did I say that they, was, they were instructed by the Lord. They looked to the Bible for instruction to, to see what it said. Not one time. Why? Because they, they, were, they feared man and what man thinks rather than knowing what the Word of God says. And people have been held back from fulfilling the Word and the will of God in their lives because of tradition, because of man. Amen? So that's the definition of a, tra a, a tradition. So Paul gives them a bless you. So Paul gives them a, um, a shot in the arm, if you were, or if you will, about this tradition. Now remember, he, this is 2,000 years ago. Women were veiled 2,000 years ago. Women came to church veiled 2,000 years ago. If you look in, uh, in Islam, women still are veiled. Women still are veiled. There's a purpose in that. I don't necessarily agree with it because this is 2015, but I understand the intent of what they're trying to do. Everybody understand that? So we still see it today in some forms. And I praise you because you always remember me and keep the traditions just as I, this as I delivered them to you. But I want you to know that Christ is the head over the man. And the man is the head over the woman or the wife. Now a lot of people can read that and say, oh man. Oh, and it says that God is the head of Christ. If you read that without reading it in context, without knowing the way the order of God, if you don't know the steps of God, at that point, if you are married, or some people in the church have held women back, why? Because of that verse. Because of that verse. Because they, they take it out of context. Amen? And in ignorance, listen to me very closely, I'm not trying to step on anybody's feet, but we're all guilty of it. And in ignorance, instead of instead of searching the Word of God, instead of raising up and saying, hold on a second, that's not what God's Word says. Instead of challenging the authority in a respectful way, God's will hasn't been done in the lives of a lot of people. They've been held back from doing what God has asked them to do. Why? Because of tradition. Because of tradition. This is something that I dealt with because I did not read the Word of God and correctly divide it for years. I just automatically assumed that what I read and what I was taught was correct until I, here's what people don't understand. You can go to a church and you can have the pastor preach to you or the priest give you a sermon out of a book. But as a Christian, you have, God's, God, you have God inside of you. You have the author of, of, of God inside of you. You do not have to depend on man. I told you that. It says that in Second uh, Peter one twenty seven. Says you, you don't have to. You have an anointing on you. Man is not going to teach you what God is going to teach you. God is going to teach you, not man. The Holy Spirit will teach you. Paul went away for three years to Arabia, and during that time, 
the Lord showed him the ministry of grace and reconciliation. Why? Because God had to break him down from his traditions. He said, I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He knew the law. Yet God had to break it down to him for three years. Why? So he could come back and teach the right thing. Amen? So we might need to be broken down. Everybody say, Lord, Lord break, me down break me down to build me up to build in me. Jesus' name. In Jesus name. And when you see God as a God of the Word, so every man and, and uh, every man who prays or prophesies. Well, let's let's do this. Let's stick on that part right there. So one way to interpret the Bible is with the Bible. God has a pattern and a way of doing things. God is the same today, yesterday, and forever. Hebrews 13, 1. I'm going to give you a bunch of scriptures, so be ready to write it down. Okay? But here it says that, that man is the head of woman. Okay, when you look at the order of the way that God created us, that is correct. God created man, and he created woman. Correct? correct? That is in the order of how he did it. Not one time you see, since God made man first, he is to rule over the woman with an with a iron fist. Does everybody understand that? Okay, I'm going to keep reading because I, I need to read this in context. But every woman who prays or prophesies, that's very important too. Every woman who prays or prophesies, okay? What is, when someone, prophes, when someone does a, speaks a prophecy, she is a prophet. Or he is a prophet. That is one of the fivefold ministries. Okay? Now, if God wanted to constrict a woman, then you would not see her prophesying. True? She would, he would not say, if a woman prays or prophesies. Why? Because that would have been forbidden in the church. But obviously it's not. Why? Because Paul says, if a woman is praying or prophesying, that means it's being done. Amen? Amen. With her head uncovered, dishonors her head. Since that is one, this, that is one and the same as having her head shaved. So, at, so if a woman's head is not covered, for her hair should be cut off. But, if, but, if, but it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved. She should be covered. Okay, we're, dealing, we're dealing with tradition. A man, in fact, should not cover his head because he is God's image and glory. But woman is man's glory. What the heck does that mean? For man did not come from woman, but woman came from man. And man was not created for women, but women for man. Now, a lot of people can take that the wrong way. You can say, oh, no, 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 you get to do what I want to do. You, I wasn't created for you. You were created for me. And since you were created for me, I can tell you what I want you to do. And that's the way it is. I'm the man. How many people have you heard say that? Come on now, be truthful. Yes, I'm the man. I'm the man. I'm the man. I can't say that around my wife because I know the truth. And so does she. I can't say, I'm the man. Okay, I'm the man. But what Paul is doing here, if you read it out of context, if you take it the way it wasn't meant to be uh, interpreted, you could, at, at that point, you could say, well, hold on, you're the man. You're going to do what you want to do. But no, that's not what he's talking about. Okay? That's not what he's talking about. Flip over to Genesis. He's giving the order of creation. He's giving the order of creation. Uh, Genesis 1, I'm going to read a couple of verses. Uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, I'm going to start with verse, with chapter 2, verse 20. And I'm going to read uh, verse 27 of chapter 1 first. It says, God, so God created man in his own light, in his own image. He created him in, his, in the image of God. He created them male and female. There's the order. Okay, if you jump to verse 20 of chapter 2, it says this. The man, okay, the man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky, and to every wild animal. Before the man, no helper was found as to complete him. To complete him. That's extremely significant. To make him whole. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man. And he, sl and he slept. Excuse me. God took his, took, took his ribs and closed the flesh at his place. Then the Lord God made the rib. Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman. And brought her to the man. 
And the man said, This one at last is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for she has she was taken from man. This is why a man leaves his father and his mother and is bound to his wife, and they become one flesh. Both the man and his wife were naked, and yet were without shame. How did God do this? He created his male and female, right? He created the man first, and then he created the women. But who was before the man? Jesus, who created the man and the woman. God did. Okay, so Paul is not talking about the structure of like, I'm the man, you're, you're, you're below me. No, he is giving the order in which God did something. Is giving the order of creation. Does everybody understand that? Amen. Does everybody agree with that? You better. You got to get out. Now. Nobody laughed. Why did nobody laugh? Okay, we're going to get to that in a minute. Now remember, there's tradition. Okay. What's the tradition? The tradition was a veil. You come into church. You go to Mexico right now. You see the women going in with veils, long black veils. But you also, huh? I like that in black Okay, okay. You see that? Okay, you see that? We come to we come to this rabbinical right here in this very room on Saturdays. They have a Christian Jewish fellowship. Okay, and you see men and women with something wrapped around their 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 uh, their necks. That's a prayer shawl. And when they pray, they lift that shawl over their head. Okay, that's a person. That's a tradition that's passed down, a Jewish tradition. Okay? And the same thing that what Paul's talking about. Okay? When is the last time you saw a woman wearing a veil in a church? Or a hat? Extremely rare. Okay? Is it okay if they do that? Well, absolutely it's okay. That's their tradition. But that has nothing to do, listen to me very closely. Everybody look at me when I'm getting ready to say, has nothing to do with your relationship to God or how godly you are. Period. Zero. Nothing. The things that you do have nothing to do with your relationship with God. What does God want? Obedience and love. That's it. That's all we're to do. Do we think that we're going to be more godly if our hair is longer than someone else's? No. Heaven forbid. Or as a man, if we, if we, if we wear pants and women don't wear pants. No, that is a tradition. Just like the yellow suit I was telling you about. Okay? What did Jesus always get on the Pharisees for? You honored the tradition of man before God's law. He threw that in their face. What are you doing? You put that above the law. Oh, God. How dare you? Okay. Let's turn over. I can prove this to you. Go to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 16. When God was when, when God was getting ready to pick David. 16 1? Uh, 16. Hold on a second. This is one of my God enlightened me when I read this for the first time. It was amazing. Uh, actually, uh, let's see. Um, 16, 16.5. Okay. Samuel the prophet goes to pick the next king of Israel. The first king of Israel, if you read in chapter 15, was rejected by God. Okay. When Samuel picked Saul, the first king of Israel, the people demanded a king. Because up until that time, they were, they were, they were governed by, by, um, by judges and, and prophets. Okay, so Samuel is a prophet. He's a priest. Okay? So God rejected Saul. Why did God reject Saul? Because of one thing. Because he did he was disobedient. He had a man that would come to him and say, Listen, Saul, this is what the Lord wants you to do. He was speaking on behalf of God. And, and Saul did not do that. So God said, I'm going to reject Saul and I'm going to find a man for myself that has the heart of God. A man after my own heart, who is obedient, who is careful to do what I ask him to do. Look, everybody, look at me. God wants your obedience. It is more important to God than sacrifice. If that were not true, how come we're not killing bulls and lambs and goats? Why? Because that did not satisfy God. What satisfies Him? 
contrite and a broken spirit. Someone who is obedient, who will listen to Him. You don't believe me? If you have children and you ask them to do something and they don't do it, what happens? You get upset. But you ask them to do it and they say, yes, sir, and they get it done. That brings warmth to your heart. Why? Because obedience. And not only that, if they do it with love, man, obedience and love, oh my goodness. You can go far in the kingdom of God. That's all you do if you love God, love your neighbor, and are obedient to listen to the voice of God. Amen? You can go a long way. So here, Samuel is sent by God to pick the next king. Okay, we all know that he picks King David. But did you know that King David had several brothers, like seven brothers? Okay, so Samuel goes to the house. And he says this. Samuel did what the Lord directed. Okay, just hold on a second. Verse 5, in peace, so uh, he goes in peace, he replied, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he concentrate, consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. If you notice, it did not say, and David. David was in the field. Tended sheep. Dirty, stinky, messy. When he arrived, Samuel <laughs> saw Elad, uh, Elad, Eladad. He said, okay, this is, the, this is Jesse's oldest son. Now listen to what this prophet of God, who knows God, who has a track record with listening to God and doing what God says. When he sees David's brother, this is what he says. He says, certainly the Lord's anointing is standing before me. Boom, I see what he looks like. He comes in. He's a good-looking young man, tall, stature. Very had these features like a like a you know like a like a kingly person, had a kingly statement about him. And the prophet says, Man, this is God's anointed. Where's my oil? I've got to anoint this person. He's got talent. She's got, oh, she can sing. Oh man, she can dance, she can do all this, she can teach the Bible. But if God says no, then it means no. If God doesn't tell you to do it, don't do it. Don't do what you think. Why? Because this is what God, this is the heart of God here. God is not concerned about, you know what? The Bible says that beauty is deceptive. It, it says uh, beauty is deceitful and charm, charm is vain and beauty is, it, wait, hold on a second. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. It's, it's going to go away. All this stuff is going to go away. Well, the people will be old and ugly one day. All of us are. Yeah, yeah all you pretty people are going to be old and ugly one day. All of us. But what's going to remain is your character. How you were obedient to Christ. That's the only thing that's going to matter when you stand before God. So you, did you do what He asked you to? Did you serve Him according to what He asked you to? So he saw uh, Eliab and said, Certainly the Lord's anointed is standing before me. Verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not. He rebuked this prophet. He said, do not look at his appearance or his stature, because I have rejected him. Man does not see what the Lord sees, for man sees what is visible, but the Lord sees the heart. The Lord sees the heart. He didn't say a, a, a woman could do it or a child could do it. No, he wants somebody that's obedient. He wants somebody that will listen to God. Talent doesn't mean anything. It literally doesn't. But would you rather, you know what, if I, as a coach, I, I, as I've coached people, sports, I've, I've coached sports, I would rather have somebody that gave me everything that he had every time he stepped on the court or the field before I take somebody that had talent. Because those tend to be the people that are lazy. Why? Because they rely on their talent to get them through. Yet they don't give, remember the movie, the movie Rudy? A little bit short dude. And the coach told him, he said, Rudy, if I had, if I had people just like you, we, we'd never lose. Never lose. People, listen to me closely. People are struggling. Bless you, sister. People are struggling with just listening to God. That's all you got to do. Be obedient to what He tells you. And examine it through the Word. If it doesn't match the Word of God, don't do it. If it does line up with the Word of God, then you've got confirmation right there. And God will give you other confirmation. Do what He asks you to do. Do what He asks you to do. 
Amen? Why? Because he doesn't see our actions as much as he does our heart. You remember how, what, was, what it was like before you got saved? You were dirty. I was dirty. Dirty, dirty. I had a dirty heart. I confess that to you. I had a dirty heart. And then God came in and gave me a new heart. He gave me a new heart. Amen? Amen. Why are we relying on the traditions of man and not putting God first? Why are we doing that? Why are we looking at a person and saying, this person isn't good enough to be doing, to stand up there and preach? This person isn't good enough to, be, to, to go out and, and, uh, and feed the homeless? This person isn't, isn't good enough to do this? No. Man doesn't view us in that respect. He looks at our heart. He wants obedience and love. Not sacrifice. But what do we tend to do? We tend, we tend to sacrifice. Well, Lord, you know, I'll do this. This is the way I'm going to gain your, your mercy. And God's like, get that out of my face. I, no, 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 no. No. I love you unconditionally. That means there's no strings attached when you come to the Lord. He doesn't say, you know what? I am going to give you my salvation. But this is what you have to do in order to get it. It's not, it's not in this book. I've never read that. It's not in there. It says what? All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It says one believes, one, one, one confesses with the mouth, and believes with the heart. That's all you got to do. I don't, I don't hear anything about killing any animals, sacrificing anything, quitting your job, doing it. No, that's not what God wants. But if He tells you to do it, then do it. Out of obedience. Yes. Sometimes uh, we try to understand the Lord from a logical sense. Yes. And uh, you can't try to understand him the way I would try to understand you. Not the same. Because uh, his doing is going to be as if you would do something for him. It's going to be done in a supernatural way. Uh, not yes. And I'm glad you brought that up. You know what, guys? It's Pastor God no. and my God. No. We're not. Don't ever put any one of us on a pedestal. Ever. Don't you put another human on a, on a pedestal. Don't do it. You will get hurt. I'm, I'm here to confess right now. I might, I might hurt your feelings. I might make you feel bad one day. I might, make, I might say something that might make you feel bad or hurt your feelings. I want to apologize up front. I'm sorry. I'm a person. And guess what? You're going to do that to me too. So we're clear. We're clear on that? Why? Because we're people. Do, we, do I want to do that? No, of course not. That's not my, I never want to do that. Okay? Because I, I want to live my, you know, I don't wake up in the morning. The last thing I want to do is sin. That's the last thing on my mind. You know, I'm not going to sin today. No, actually, I'm like, how am I not going to sin? How am I going to live my life for you today, Lord? How am I going to listen to your voice? How am I going to be obedient? I want to be sensitive to God's voice. I want to, I want to do what he's asked me to do. Why? Because he said, if I can trust you with the little things, then I'm going to give you greater things. Most of us want to do the great things before we listen to me. Most of us want to do the great things before, you know, say, I want to, I want to preach. I want to do this. I want to do that. We, we uh, got started in the ministry when my kids were young. And, and, the, and, this, and the guy that was running the ministry was a young guy. Okay? And he goes like, yeah, he, and I told him, I said, I'll do whatever you want me to. He said, well, no, you, you've been a Christian for a long time. Let, let's, why don't you do this? I said, listen. So I put a brush in my hand. I was, I would clean the toilet. He's like, well, I said, yeah. I said, I don't, I don't, you can't put me in a position right now that uh, I don't deserve. I can't have proven myself to you. Okay, I, went, I started scrubbing, I scrubbed toilets in the, in the ministry. Before you know it, I was teaching at Bible school. Okay? You, you, you need to, you can't, God is not going to automatically put you, put you in the pulpit. You've got to go through some stuff. You've got to learn some things. God has to, God has to break you down to, to build you back up. Amen? Amen. To, to get you to learn some stuff. Would you rather somebody preach to you that just went to seminary and doesn't know anything? Or do you want somebody that preaches to you because of what God has showed them and the things he's walked out in his own life? That's who you want preaching to, right? True? Mm -hmm. You want someone who's lived it and given it to you than someone who's read about it, about somebody else living it. You want somebody who knows what they're talking about. Amen? Amen. Okay, back to 1 Corinthians. But, but remember, God, there's a trend with God. We see his heart. He doesn't evaluate a person on their appearance. That's male, female, teenager, child. 
old person, whatever. It doesn't, it doesn't matter because he views our heart. He views our heart. Amen? No appearance, none of that stuff. I'm going to start with verse 7. A man, in fact, should not cover his head because he is God's image and, the, and, and glory. But a woman is man's glory. Because, again, why? Because of what we just read. He's not, he's not, he's not meaning that the, the man is over the woman.